Well, again, good morning. Uh, we continue uh, in our journey through Mark's gospel this morning. Uh, last week, uh, Chuck and his sermon alluded to our reading uh, this morning concerning James and John, the, the sons of Zebedee. Uh, this morning, though, we're going to really go <clears throat> a little bit deeper into this particular passage. Uh, and one of the very obvious um, themes that arise out of this passage uh, as we work through these verses, is the theme of ambition. Ambition becomes very obvious as we work through it. And, and ambition, it's strong, it's powerful, it's a, it's actually, it can be a really positive character trait to have, can it? Uh, ambition is that desire and that motivation to achieve something great. And I mean, and to be successful. And if we've ever been, if you've ever been in a position to try to hire somebody uh, for your organization, a position for your company, or to be on your staff, then there's no doubt that you were looking for someone who had great ambition, weren't you? Uh, that's what we go looking for. Ambitious people, they, they have that internal drive to succeed. And so you know ambitious people are going to further drive your mission and your vision uh, for your organization. Uh, they'll help you to grow and achieve all of your goals. Ambition isn't a bad thing. In fact, ambition can be an incredibly powerful and positive thing in a person's life. But as all powerful desires go, ambition can also be destructive. It can also be detrimental to, to both the person who possesses the ambition and to all those who stand in the way of their ambition. Ambition has the, the power to corrupt your values and to destroy anyone who stands in the way of your desires and your goals. And the Bible's full of these kind of examples of, of destructive human ambitions. Ambitions for personal glory at the expense of everyone else uh, around them. And this morning's reading from Mark 10 is one of those examples. It's one of those examples of destructive personal ambition. Uh, but it's also, at the same time, a testimony to the power that the gospel has to expose uh, our destructive ambitions and to transform them uh, for God's glory by His grace alone. And, and if we are honest, most all of our ambitions in life, most of them are self-serving. Most of our ambitions are self-serving and they're self-glorifying and they're in desperate need of being transformed. And so with great ambition that we all hear the gospel proclaimed through this passage, I want to invite you to, to open up your Bibles or to open up your bulletins as we work through this passage of ours this morning together. You know, as I, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, uh, everything that's happening in Mark's gospel right now and that we've been looking at for the past few weeks uh, has Jesus and his disciples moving closer and closer to Jerusalem. They're moving closer and closer to the, the epicenter of Israel's religious life. Uh, the most important place for all Jewish people, the home of the temple, uh, the place where God's people go to meet with him, the place where all Jewish authority and power resides, Jesus is making his way with the disciples ever closer. And in verse 32, we're told now that Jesus and his disciples are actually now physically on the road going up to Jerusalem. They've been making their way all along, but through different ways and uh, taking different diversions. But now they are on the road going up to Jerusalem. And for most of us, you know, we have the advantage of knowing what lies ahead for Jesus uh, and his disciples when they do get to Jerusalem. But for just a moment, try to kind of suspend as best you can that knowledge so you can fully put yourself in, in the position uh, of the moment and understand maybe better what's happening with the disciples and with Jesus in this moment. Uh, they're walking, we're told, uh, and as they're walking, we're told that Jesus uh, was walking up ahead of them. 
Jesus is walking ahead of him. Now, on the one hand, there's nothing really strange about a rabbi walking up in front and leading his uh, disciples. That was a, a normal way of travel. It wasn't particularly abnormal. Uh, but the next sentence does tell us that there's something significant going on here than just the, the rabbi-disciple relationship. Uh, because we're told that the disciples were amazed. Jesus is walking up ahead of them, and we're told that the disciples were amazed, and then we're also told that those who followed were afraid. So if this was just a normal event of everyday lives of the disciples, Jesus walking ahead and them following, why were they so amazed by Jesus walking in front of them on this day? And why are we being told about it? And furthermore, why are the other people who were on the road uh, to Jerusalem were told full of fear? There's something else going on here. Just so you know, the other people who were on the road, uh, they're heading up to Jerusalem for the Passover. These are the pilgrims who were on the way to go celebrate the feast of the Passover in Jerusalem. So there's others around on the road with them, and those people who are with them are full of fear. There's something else going on here. There's something much deeper. Uh, you know, it's no secret that Jesus has, uh, has been at odds with the Jewish authorities for some time. Jesus had spoken boldly against the Pharisees and the scribes. He had spoken even boldly against King Herod himself. And, and we're even told in Mark 3, uh, earlier uh, in, in Mark's gospel, that after Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath, that the Pharisees and scribes were so upset about it that they went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against Jesus and how to kill him. And how to kill him. So while not, while not fully understanding what lies ahead of them, there is this awareness that the disciples have uh, that they're heading towards some great confrontation. There's something big. They're, they're kind of heading into the eye of the storm. Uh, they're heading into, in, into danger, certainly not away from it. And the disciples, we're told, are amazed by this. Uh, it fills them with amazement. And yet the other people also seem to have some notion that if Jesus is there something's going down. Something's going down. And so they're full of fear at what this might mean. What might this mean? And yet there is Jesus with the amazed disciples and the fear-filled people on the way to the pilgrimage, Jesus walking in front of them. You know, he's walking as one who's determined, ambitious to face whatever it is that awaits him when he gets to Jerusalem. And this was even more remarkable considering that Jesus knew exactly what awaited him when he would get there to Jerusalem, even if the disciples and the pilgrims don't fully understand yet. Jesus tried to tell them. He tried to tell them. In fact, this is the third time that Jesus has tried to tell the disciples what exactly was going to happen when they got to Jerusalem. They haven't understand it, understood it the first time two times. Let's see what happens this time. Uh, in verses 33 and 34, he told them there's six things. There's six, six things that are going to happen. Uh, that he will be delivered over to the chief priests and to the scribes. They will condemn him to death. They will deliver him uh, over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, spit on him. They'll flog him and kill him. And then after three days, he will rise. Jesus makes it pretty clear, doesn't he? Uh, he makes it pretty clear. This is what's awaiting us. This is what's going to happen in Jerusalem. Well, it, it might be obvious to us and seem pretty clear, but it wasn't. We, we, we've, we've got the benefit of hindsight. They didn't. They don't understand fully what's going on. Uh, and it, it's going to be very evident in just a, a few minutes. Uh, but before we go there, now knowing that Jesus knew all this about what awaited him when he got to Jerusalem, does it not surprise you that he was walking with such great ambition, such resoluteness towards his destiny, which he knew fully well meant his own suffering and death? Jesus was leading the way. He was leading the way to his own suffering and death. Jesus was a man of great ambition, and his ambition was to follow through in full ob obedience the plan that his heavenly father had given to him to accomplish. That was his ambition. Jesus' ambition was not for his own honor or his own glory, but rather his ambition was for his father's 
ultimate glory, even though it meant his own suffering and death in the process. Jesus' ambition was one of self-sacrifice, not one of self-glory, which is important to understand in this as we now kind of go to the other side of things. Uh, we go from this Jesus who's, who's resolutely, ambitiously following his Father's glory, heading to his own suffering and death, and we go back to the disciples and what's going on with them at this point, namely what's happening with James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Men who we'll see were full of great ambition. Uh, they were the kind that we would certainly celebrate. They're the kind of guys we'd want to hire. We want them to come onto our staff because of their great loyalty, uh, their determination. These are guys that we would want and we would honor. James and John were incredibly loyal. They were dedicated to Jesus. If you can remember, uh, Jesus is calling to them. Uh, he called the sons of Zebedee. They were in the boat with their father, mending the nets. Uh, he called them to come and follow him. And what did they do? They dropped everything, and they went and followed Jesus. They left everything. They're, they are incredibly dedicated to the cause. These guys care deeply. Uh, they were ambitious for Jesus, and they were loyal to the core. They wanted to succeed. They had every reason. They wanted to be a part of this. And in verse 35, we're told this, that James and John came up to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. You know, and you laugh. Just imagine the scene, you know, Jesus walking. For, before we get to that, like, think about it. Jesus is walking up ahead of everyone, right? Uh, James and John kind of run up to, to get him, uh, uh, make sure that out of earshot of everyone else, they want a little private time with Jesus, just a little conversation between them uh, where the rest of the disciples won't hear it. Now, for the question itself, if you're a parent or you can ever remember being a child, you know that you never answer an ambiguous question like this, right? Uh, you never answer that question uh, or else you end up with a pet pony or a child who's really, really upset. Uh, one of the two. Uh, but kids are going to try, right? They're, they're presumptuous and they're bold. And here James and John showed their presumptiveness, uh, their boldness with Jesus to come up to them and ask them this question. And, and maybe their presumptuousness uh, would, would have been okay if they had asked Jesus, you know, to, hey, Jesus, can we, we really want to do the dishes after dinner tonight, uh, you know, which just would be great if my children did that ever. That would be great. Uh, but notice how gracious, despite this question, which is incredibly bold and presumptuous, uh, notice how gracious Jesus was with them. In verse 36, he simply asks, what do you want me to do for you? What an incredibly, to hear the heart of Jesus, to asking that question of, of, of just knowing the presumptuousness of the question and probably the motivations that came from behind it. Uh, and yet Jesus wants to hear. He wants to know. Ask me. Ask me what you want to know. He doesn't seem to mind the, the presumptuousness and the, uh, the boldness of their request. Uh, and this is what they asked in verse 37. Grant us to sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. Now James and John were loyal again. They were faithful from the very beginning. But their request, it wasn't really about loyalty. It wasn't really about faithfulness. Or it, I say it may have been what they thought it was about. Uh, their request was all about really those selfish ambition. It also it, it exposed something that they completely had a false idea of what they were heading into, uh, about what awaited them when they finally arrived in Jerusalem, because they had visions of glory. They had visions of glory of a triumphant Jesus who would ride into uh, Jerusalem and unseat the corrupt Jewish authorities and the, the Roman and serpers, that, and that he would take his rightful place on the throne over all of Israel, uh, taking David's rightful place as the heir and the king of Israel. Oh, what a glorious day that would be. That's what's going on with these disciples. That's what they're expecting, that that's what the Messiah is going to fulfill. And as faithful and loyal disciples, James and John, they wanted a piece of that glory. They wanted a piece of it for themselves. They wanted to see their loyalty and their dedication and all the sacrifice they had made, which was great. They, they walked away from everything to follow Jesus. 
And they wanted to see that all pay off in the end. They wanted to see the full profit of this great investment of their lives that they had made in Jesus. And before we move on, though, to hear what Jesus is going to say about all this, you know, consider the fruit, though, for just a minute of, of James and John's ambition. What was the fruit of that? Well, in their ambition, they had completely put themselves above their fellow disciples, hadn't they? They, they wanted the glory over them, and they were willing to sell them out for it. <laughs> they were quickly willing to, to, to leave them, uh, throw them under the bus. And they wanted to be recognized as the most important, to have the, most play, the biggest place of, of honor, which means they wanted to be recognized as the ones who were the most loyal, the most faithful, and therefore the most honored over their fellow disciples. They completely sold them out. You know, one commentary I read on this said that this is the only time uh, in Mark's gospel where, uh, where James and John are mentioned without Peter being there. Peter had been with them all the time. This means that they broke ranks with Peter, their good buddy. They sold him out and they went up to seek glory for themselves. All they could think about was the ultimate glory. They felt entitled in their relationship with Jesus because of their own good works, their loyalty, their faithfulness, their sacrifice, uh, and, and their need to win at the game of life was more important than anything else. That need to win was more important than any love or commitment or faithfulness to their fellow disciples. Their ambition led them to completely throw everyone else under the bus, bus who would have stood in their way of success and glory. That's what ambition does in our hearts. I have no doubt that in their hearts of hearts, they probably felt completely justified, don't you think? They could, they could name the reasons why they should be the ones to, to receive the glory. They deserved the recognition. They deserved the honor and praise because they were loyal and dedicated and they had sacrificed much. Forget about everyone else's loyalty and faithfulness and, uh, and sacrifice. That, that's not as important as mine is. And, and that's what our selfish ambition, that's what it does. Uh, that's, that's what it reveals about us and in our hearts. And let's be clear about this. You don't have to, our, usually our idea of the, the evil, ambitious person is, you know, the wealthy tycoon uh, who uh, is the selfish, ambitious one. Uh, you don't have to be a CEO of the evil corporation where your ambition for glory. They don't have to be sitting on top of the corporate ladder, uh, bathing in a pile of money and power and success. You know, we like to vilify that type of person, right? But there's another kind of ambition which is equally, if not so, far more destructive and deadly and leaves even more of a pile of dead bodies in our quest for the top. That ambition, it's a spiritual ambition. It's a spiritual ambition. The desire uh, and the drive to be the best, to be the most humble maybe, to be the most, uh, to take pride in our achievements by, or to be the most pure, to be the most kind, to be the most generous. We can be equally as ambitious towards those things for our selfish ambitions towards glory. And we take pride in that achievement by condemning those who we look around and think, well, they're not, they couldn't possibly be as, as, as humble and as pious and as pure as I am. Because spiritual ambition makes us think that because of our loyalty, because of our dedication, because of our sacrifice, we deserve God's honor and glory and therefore favor in our, in our lives more than anybody else. And so in our ambition, what we actually are doing is we're turning God into an idol. We're turning it into a guide, uh, an idol that we make and form with our own hands that we can manipulate to be able to do the things that we want him to do in our own favor. Make no mistakes, we have uh, what seems to be holy and righteous ambition uh, that's really uh, the most deadly of all ambitions because it's really only rooted in our own seeking of vain uh, our own desires for vain glory and recognition. And when life doesn't turn out, when that's our ambition and life doesn't turn out in our favor, with the blessing and the prosperity that we desire, our hearts just are filled with resentment and anger towards God. How could you let this happen to me, God? I deserve better than this. I've been ambitious in all the right ways. 
Because our hearts of ambition tell us that we deserve better. That's what, that's what our hearts tell us, at least better than what our, our heathen brothers or neighbors ha- are, you know, and they've got the big car and the big house, and nothing bad seems to happen to them. So don't judge James and John too harshly, because the truth is we are them, full of our own blind and selfish ambition. And the good news he does, right? Jesus does condemn them for this selfish uh, ambition, which is really actually good news uh, for us because Jesus calls out our own selfish ambition, uh, spiritual ambitions as well. Jesus in verse 38 said to them, you don't know what you're asking. You don't know what you're asking. You know, Jesus didn't say, you foolish, foolish, selfish people. They deserved that, but he didn't do it. Uh, you know, he, he says, you don't know what you're asking. You know, his answer to them is incredibly compassionate and loving, caring for them more. He goes, you guys don't understand. You don't understand because if you did, there's no way you'd be asking me for this kind of honor. In verse 38, he says, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? You know, again, they, they were thinking about Jesus' words really quite literally and in the context of their vision of glory, of what was to come. Uh, they did not understand that Jesus was using these words in more of a metaphorical or even a prophetic meaning, uh, going back to the imagery of both of these things from, from the Old Testament. Uh, the cup of the Lord in the Old Testament was the, is the cup of God's wrath against all ungodly, ungodliness. In Jeremiah 25, uh, God talks about the cup of the Lord's wrath will be upon the nations. In Habakkuk chapter 2, the cup of the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will come upon your glory. The cup that Jesus is talking about is the cup that he is going to drink of the wrath that God has for all ungodliness, for all sinful people. He's going to drink the cup of God's wrath that is upon all of us for our selfish ambition, our own seeking of vain glory for ourselves. And the baptism that Jesus is referring to is the baptism of his own death on the cross for the sins of the world. But again, James and John, having only their own glory in in mind uh, and what they thought was to come, told Jesus that they'd be able to do it. Well, we can do it. We're able Jesus said that they will indeed, though, drink from this cup that he drinks and be baptized with this baptism. You know, and there's some disagreement about what this might mean. Does this talking about, yep, you are going to die. Uh, you're going to die this death. I think, yeah, there obviously is something in that that Jesus is saying, but there's something much more. What he means is that they, and the same with us, uh, along with us, that we, with all people who put their faith in Jesus, we're going to experience Jesus is drinking from the cup of wrath for us. We're going to receive the baptism of Jesus' own death as a substitute for our own rebellion and sin. But the place of honor at his right or at his left, Jesus told them, wasn't his to grant. It wasn't his, but it was for those with whom it had been prepared. And again, what we see in this is, is the, two, the two ambitions, uh, uh, the ambitions of the disciples in contrast to Jesus' own ambition. Jesus' ambition even here is for his Father's glory. It's in submission to his Father. It's not a selfish ambition, and yet we're seeing it in contrast to theirs. Jesus' ambition was for his Father's glory. It was always in submission to his Father's authority and his plan. It was never for his own glory or honor. Well, at this point in our passage, the rest of the ten disciples, they catch word, right? Or they catch, the, they, they understand what's going on. They got wind of what James and John had been up to, what they've been scheming in this uh, plot for selfish ambition, and we're told they were absolutely indignant with them. They were absolutely indignant. They weren't just simply angry, or they weren't just sad that that James and John would betray them and throw them under the bus and all of this. We're told they were indignant. 
It's important to, to, to understand the difference because uh, what this means is that they were incredibly annoyed at them for thinking that they were more worthy of honor uh, and, and of glory than they themselves were. They didn't think that, that James and John were wrong, mind you. That's not really what this has to do with. Uh, what it has to do about is they were mad and they were annoyed that James and John had beat them to the punch. They wanted the glory just as much. They wanted the honor just as much for themselves, just as much as we want it for ourselves, which then led Jesus to teach them about what glory really looks like in the kingdom of God. In verse 43 and 44, whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first must be a slave of all. In other words, in the kingdom of God, ambition is good. If your ambition is to serve other people and to commit your lives to think more of others than you think of yourself, uh, Jesus turns the paradigm of worldly glory completely upside down. That's why he says, look at the Gentiles. They take authority and power and glory and lord it over others. But that's not how it will be with you. Honor is found not in fighting your way to the top and leaving behind the, a mountain of dead bodies in your wake. Honor is found in building others up and always putting others, uh, you're putting yourself behind others, putting others before you, seeking what's good and best for other people. In the kingdom of God, the only good and godly ambition is an ambition of self-sacrifice. That was Jesus' ambition. And his ambition was to glorify his Father by loving us and by laying down his life for our salvation. You know, Jesus concluded this all uh, by saying to them in verse 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That was the, that's the kind of ambition that honors God. Jesus gave his life for us. He paid our ransom, meaning he paid the debt that we owe to God for our selfish ambition. The payment that, that had to be paid for our freedom from sin and death. We owe our freedom to Jesus alone. Our honor, our glory it's not found in our own achievement. It's found in what Jesus achieved for us on the cross. Our hope, our joy, our glory, it's never found in our own ambitions for greatness. They're found in Jesus' ambition to honor and glorify God by faithfully and resolutely walking into Jerusalem to face his own suffering and death. Friends, our ambitions betray us. And they expose the true nature of our hearts. But Jesus' ambition of sacrificial love, that's our salvation. And so the message is this, to put your faith in Jesus and his finished work on the cross and allow his grace and his love to transform your ambitions of glory to ambitions of sacrificial love and service to others which is the only kind of ambition that counts for anything in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen.